It's my great pleasure to introduce this next presentation on designing and validating a sustainable Antarctic station, Antarctica New Zealand's Scott based redevelopment project and the Custom Sustainability Accreditation Scheme by Peter Taylor, Antarctica New Zealand. Good morning and welcome to this presentation. Thank you for joining me. I am Peter Taylor from Antarctica New Zealand and today I'll be talking to you about designing and validating a sustainable Antarctic station in the context of Antarctica New Zealand's Scott based redevelopment project. So before I delve into the sustainable design elements of the project, here is a quick project update. For more information on the project, be sure to view Simon Shelton and Hugh Broughton's presentation in the Station Modernisation Symposium. We are currently in developed design, so this is a stage where the footprint and the layout of the buildings is being fixed, leading into detailed drawings being developed. We are proposing to build and commission entirely in New Zealand, with the logistics option being to ship large building modules to Antarctica and reassemble. And we are currently finalising the CEE for submission to the Committee for Environmental Protection in 2021. So Scott Base is currently a sprawling station, as you can see here, with 12 interconnected buildings numerous outbuildings and storage. Associated infrastructure increases the footprint of the station further. The station is located on Pram Point, adjacent to the National Science Foundation's McMurdo Station. And there are numerous issues with the current design, along with an evolving science portfolio, and the end of design life looming has led to the decision to redevelop the site with a new station. Operational issues with the current Scott base have been designed out with the proposed station. Here we have three interconnected two-storey buildings which replace all of the facilities from the existing Scott base and remove the need for numerous outbuildings and external storage. The design was largely driven by user requirements. These were centred around Antarctic operations, engineering support, science and base services. Sustainability requirements came in a different form, and one that is not visible on a rendered design. The station, looking towards Observation Hill on the left, and the National Science Foundation's McMurdo Station, beyond the gap, beyond the hill. So, sustainability requirements. They are grounded in the strategic objectives for the project. Here too are presented to protect the Antarctic environment, and to provide an environment that keeps people safe and healthy. The first being centred around the physical environment, and the second which is not as tangible as a sustainability requirement, but one that is imperative and is directly linked within this presentation. These objectives can be further broken down to some of the specific requirements for the project. Many of these are quite generic, but were determined by Antarctica New Zealand to give effect to the strategic objectives. And all requirements build towards a final requirement listed to achieve an independent accreditation for sustainable design. So what is sustainable design? Sustainable design attempts to reduce environmental impacts during the production of building components, the construction process, as well as the whole life cycle of the building. But Sustainability in the built environment is more than just the environment. Sustainable design covers social sustainability, the health and well-being of occupants, material and product responsibility and transparency. Sustainability can be subjective and there are multiple standards for the multiple facets which are all intricately interwoven. So then how do we design and then subjectively certify a station to be sustainable? We need a certification scheme. There are many sustainability schemes around the world, many of which are administered by the World Green Building Council. Only one, however, has experience in Antarctica, being BREAM, who are working with the British Antarctic Survey on the Rothera Discovery Building. Antarctica New Zealand, however, chose to work with the New Zealand Green Building Council. Based on their local market knowledge, 
coupled with our close collaboration on the development of a custom tool. Green Star New Zealand is the only comprehensive green building rating scheme and are a member of the World Green Building Council. And Green Star drives and rewards practices that reduce the contribution to climate change, enhance health and well-being of inhabitants, ensure the high performance of buildings, and contribute to market transformation, a concept we will go into a little further on. So with known challenges in the environment for off-the-shelf accreditation schemes, we engaged our design consultants and the New Zealand and Australian Green Building Councils to design a custom tool for use on the Scott Bass redevelopment project. The tool was based on the current accreditation tool with categories on energy and carbon management and a life cycle assessment for material impacts remaining largely unchanged. But other sections have been modified to ensure that sustainability in the Antarctic context is captured and delivered upon, including changes to indoor environmental quality to reflect occupant health and well-being, excluding transport as a category, having an emphasis on operational policy development, and having an emphasis on environmental protection based on the environmental protocol to the Antarctic Treaty System. The specifics of the, of the tool are presented here, and they fall into many categories, the first of which being management. Management is a commitment to operational performance and the setting of policies and standards to operate your building. In Green Star, the management of the building focuses on commissioning and tuning of the building, adaptation and resilience, having robust building information and commitment to performance, metering and monitoring your commitment to performance, having responsible construction practices, also taking into account operational waste, uh, and having effective site planning and layout. The occupant health and well-being is captured through modules including your quality of amenities, including facilities to enhance the well-being of occupants in the building, having emergency preparedness and emergency facilities on hand. And then a lot of the newer tangible um, health and well-being outcomes, including indoor air quality, acoustic lighting and visual comfort, having a sensory environment, indoor pollutant elimination, thermal comfort control, and universal design. A large component of Green Star, comprising 30% of the points within the accreditation scheme, is energy and water. And this is focused around efficiency of energy use, efficiency of water use, and reducing the project's contribution to climate change. Materials is captured through what's called a life cycle assessment, where the embodied and operational impacts of a certain material choice is assessed and modelled and savings are made throughout the design stage. This also takes into account responsible and sustainable material and product selection for the design. And environmental and wildlife protection, which is centred around the environmental protection protocol for the Antarctic Treaty System. Policies and procedures for biosecurity and site remediation are included, including the elimination of water pollutants and refrigerant pollutants. With this tool now developed, how then are we implementing, implementing this through the current design? So the lens of Greensar during design drives us to take a comprehensive view of multiple aspects of sustainability allowing us to take a step change in the sustainability of our operations. Some examples of driving decisions include accounting for occupant well-being as well as commissioning and performance monitoring, looking at energy and greenhouse gas emissions whilst trying to achieve the highest level of wastewater treatment, having good policy development and selecting materials that are environmentally and sustainably And so Greensar provides a measured standard to apply to requirements in this design. We were always designing for efficiency and high standard of wastewater treatment and sustainable material selection, but Greensar provides a standard and guidelines on how to achieve these requirements. It is a lot of work to meet Greensar standards, but in the end, there is a third party independent verification 
of the design, which can also lead to operational savings along the way. A big aspect of Green Star is a push for innovation and market transformation. Market transformation being the early adaptation, adoption of new and emerging technologies to increase their market exposure, allowing further market uptake. Areas of innovation explored in the Scott Base Redevelopment Project include the use of removable piles, taking into account the end of life for the designed building, full commissioning offsite and soft landings, so when the building is commissioned in Antarctica, it is known how to operate and is tuned for optimal operation. Incorporating renewable energy through a expansion of the Ross Island Wind Energy Farm. Minimizing wastewater impacts on the receiving marine environment. Integrating a building information management model for design efficiencies amongst all of the codes in the design team and tiaranga design, where the design reflects the cultural narrative of New Zealand's place in Antarctica, and cultural design solutions are incorporated into Scott Base. So the next steps for Antarctica New Zealand. In June 2021, we'll be going through a design review of the Scott Base under Green Star, where we hope to achieve five out of the six possible stars the learnings of our design review will be put together for an information paper at the CEP or the Committee for Environmental Protection, as well as COMNAP in 2021 or 2022. And based on the learnings and principles of the Green Expeditions Resolution at the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, looking forward, we could reaffirm a commitment to environmental protection and encourage collaboration between national Antarctic parties for the sharing of technologies and learnings and collaborate on the understanding of the main drivers for sustainable design in Antarctica with the final question posed of what could an Antarctic wide sustainability tool look like in the context of sustainable Antarctic operations. So thank you for watching this presentation and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me via the email or through the Com uh, Comnap Station Modernisation Symposium channels. Thank you.